Thank you for downloading episode 21 of the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast. We're back. Same music, same intro, same host, but no waffle, no wittering, and no dyslexic stutter, courtesy of some rather nifty editing. After weeks bent double with my mouth agog and eyes wide like saucepan lids, researching like buggery on bum-numbing seats in the National Archives to bring you a brand new slew of rarely told murder cases from London's West End. Right now, I'm knee-deep in autopsy reports, crime scene photos and witness statements, using the original declassified police investigation files to prepare for you an original four-part special on London's little-known spree killer, the Blackout Ripper. A sadistic homicidal maniac who stalked the dark-lit streets of Soho, slashing, ripping and slaughtering his terrified victims. And yet, the true story of the Blackout Ripper remains largely untold. Expect it in your ear holes soon. Before that, we're opening with the first of our new four-part specials and focusing on a place north of Soho on the fringes of the West End. It's the place where I live, write and record the Murder Mile True Crime podcast and a place that most Londoners don't even know exists. The Canal. Don't forget to stay tuned to the end of this episode to hear more about Murder Mile's recommended podcast of the week. This time, it's the fabulous Texas-based true crime podcast, All Crime, No Cattle. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the episode. Welcome to Murder Mile. A true crime podcast and audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved and long forgotten murders, all set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is about Sebastiano Magnanini, a lovable, fun-loving and colourful character who died in mysterious circumstances, but whose life and death left police scratching their heads. Murder Mile contains grisly descriptions which may offend, as well as realistic sounds, so that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 21, Sebastiano Magnanini. Today, I'm on my canal boat. A lovely red and green 50-foot steel vessel, which is my office by day, my bed by night, and my cosy little home since I flicked the V's to corporate slavery and embraced creative freedom. Right now, I'm chugging along at a brisk three miles an hour. The sun dappling the water, the soothing waves tickling the towpath. As perched at the stern is me, with a ship's tiller in one hand, a cup of tea in the other, and the wind slightly ruffling my few remaining hair follicles. As a soft growl of the engine merrily jiggles my gut, butt and man boobs. Ah, life is good. And as I chug along the Regent's Canal at the back of King's Cross Station, I pass a line of moored up boats, with log fires burning, a stew on the stove, and reclining on his plastic pleasure craft, amusingly adorned with pirate flags, is a beardy man in a high-vis vest, smoking a giant spliff. I call to him, Hello, my boaty brethren! Ah, get caught! Ah, yes. This is the life. Wanker! Okay. There may be the odd smattering of crime, 
The occasional weekly stabbing, daily mugging, and the sporadic hourly break-in. With the dark-lit towpath littered with zonked-out druggies, lip-wiping rent boys, and gangs of strutting rude boys grabbing the crotch of their grey terry-toweling tracksuits, like they've just rammed a branch of mother care and forgot to nab lotion for their nappy rash. But on the water itself, it's fine. The worst that will happen is your boat's bottom may scrape against the myriad of dumped bits and bobs, such as builder's rubble, car parts, stolen bikes, shopping trolleys, bank safes, World War II bombs, handguns and grenades. And sometimes clunk against the decomposing corpse of a dead cat, a dead dog, a dead fox, and occasionally a dead man. On Thursday the 24th of September, 2015, I heard such a clunk. But little did I know what it was, or even who. Forty-six-year-old Italian Sebastiano Magnanini, known by his friends as Seb, was a gregarious, fun-loving and free-spirited man with an infectious smile and an honest charm, who walked without a care in the world, and had lived the kind of life that most people can only dream of. Being fluent in Italian, English, Spanish, and even Khmer, the official language of Cambodia, as the oldest of two boys born to Italian parents in Canareggio, the northern district of Venice, Young Seb was a restless boy who was eager to see the world, meet new people, and seek out adventure. After a faltering start, as he struggled to find his feet, Seb found work as a tour guide in Cambodia, where he was described by his employer as one of the best and the most studious. Being multilingual, he taught English in Colombia, Cambodia and Thailand. And as a budding songwriter and guitarist, Seb's passion for music and uncanny knack for carpentry led to him developing a second string to his bow by rigging sets for theatre and concert venues, including Prince's gigs at Coco in Camden. Many people dream of seeing the world, but Seb had been there He'd done that, and unsurprisingly, he'd got all of the t-shirts. But by 2015, being an unmarried man in his mid-forties, with no savings, no pension, and no assets, Seb felt it was time to grow up, to settle down, and provide a stable home for his beloved daughter. In August 2015, having led a colourful life, including a brief criminal past for which he served his time, paid his price, and dedicated the next 20 years to turning over a new leaf and finding his inner peace. Seb returned to London to embark on a fledgling career in journalism. And as upbeat, joyous and caring as Seb was, he also had a dark side. As he was a man racked with an all-consuming addiction, which he had attempted to distract with adventure. But now, back in London, living a life a little less exciting, in a city surrounded by sin, Seb succumbed to his demons as he set off in search of his next fix of heroin. On the afternoon of Tuesday the 22nd of September 2015, Sebastiano Magnanini waved goodbye to his work colleagues in southwest London. And as always, being in good spirits, with a spring in his step and whistling a little ditty on his ever-smiling lips, Seb hopped on the Northern Line train, arrived at Euston Station by 4.50pm. His every movement captured on security cameras and he headed towards King's Cross. 
It made perfect sense that Seb would come here. As a kind and giving man, with a big personality, an even bigger heart, and his generosity was well known amongst the homeless community. But on that night, he wasn't here to help the homeless. He was here to feed his habit. And as he approached Caledonian Road, a busy city street just off the Regent's Canal, he stepped into the darkness and out of view of cameras forever. Three years earlier, while staying at Camden's Arlington House Homeless Hostel, Seb overdosed on heroin. He almost died. He was lucky to survive. And this should have been the wake-up call he needed to rid himself of this deadly addiction. But Seb would always be haunted by the lure of drugs. This was Seb's secret life that he had kept well hidden. Never smoking it at home for fear of being discovered. Never injecting it on the street for fear of arrest. And having burned too many bridges with friends who he had reassured he had quit. Seeing no other option, Seb would shoot up in a stranger's house. That evening, as Seb walked along Caledonian Road, a street rife with robbery, burglary, gang violence, shootings and stabbings, having taken the lives of the guilty and the innocent, Seb's addiction saw no fear, only a hunger for heroin. On this stretch of road, which was a notorious pickup point for Camden's drug pushers. As Luke Allen, his close friend, would later state, that is the lowest rung. He shouldn't have been there. But it was there, on that night, that Sebastiano Magnanini would meet a drug dealer who would end his addiction forever. His name was Michael Walsh. Strolling down the brightly lit gloom of the Caledonian Road, over the smoky hue of the Regent's Canal, where just 500 feet and two days later, Seb's decomposing corpse would be found, the two men walked, looking as dissimilar as two heroin addicts could. 46-year-old Seb, a tanned and toned Italian, with a trimmed beard, a joyous smile, a sense of style, and a characterful face etched with a lifetime of fun, love and laughter. And next to him, 41-year-old Michael Walsh, with bloodshot eyes, a hollow joyless face, and the putty-white, doughy complexion of a hardcore junkie, whose life had been spent cooking up, shooting up and zonking out. After just a five-minute walk, both men turned right into Wharfdale Road and entered Walsh's flat. The following details of what happened that night are based on unreliable, spurious and drug-addled sources. So exactly what happened may never be known. Sat in Michael Walsh's dingy flat, in an unnamed house on an unspecified part of Wharfdale Road, Seb began to feed his overpowering addiction with a deadly cocktail of alcohol, cannabis, heroin and crack cocaine. Four drugs in one body with four very different effects. The alcohol being a stimulant which increased his heart rate, blood flow and sense of well-being but decreased his balance, his moral code and his sense of danger. The cannabis, being an antidepressant, filled him with feelings of warmth, love and relaxation as he sat there in this stranger's flat. But slowly it drained him of his energy, his memory and his ability to stay awake. The heroin, being a class A stimulant, 
sent an instant rush of pleasure to his brain's opioid receptors, flushing his skin in a warm, tingly bath, like he was being cocooned in a soft sleeping bag of marshmallow, leaving Seb feeling that nothing could touch him and nothing could harm him. And with his pleasure heightened, his emotions increased, and his pain sensors blocked. With his heart heavy, his breathing slow, and his limbs like lead weights. The effects of the first three drugs were offset by a fourth. Crack cocaine. Another class A stimulant, with an intense high, but a rapid low which sunk Seb into an extreme depression, followed by bouts of paranoia, aggression, hostility, muscle spasms, and convulsions. The effects of which could only be remedied by another hit. Four drugs in one body, all fighting against each other, with the extreme highs and lows of love and anger, calm and chaos, euphoria and depression. But these were the minor effects of this lethal chemical concoction, which can also cause nausea, vomiting, itching, confusion, paranoia and hallucinations. Dropping the user's heart rate and breathing to such a life-threatening level that they risk heart attacks, stroke, seizures, coma, brain damage, and even death. Of course, as Seb was a seasoned drug user, his 46-year-old body was used to this chemical abuse, and having overdosed before, he wouldn't make the same mistake again. Not now he was older, wiser, and a man with grown-up responsibilities, like a job, a home, and a daughter. So cocooned in his heroin sleeping bag, his addiction sated, Seb fell asleep on the sofa and drifted away to dreamland. But the comfort of his dreamlike state was in stark contrast to the reality that Seb was in. As being immobile, unaware and unconscious, Trapped in the dank, dark and dingy flat of a desperate drug abuser. Whose habit was only momentarily subdued by those quick hits of crack cocaine and heroin. And now, itching, shaking and angry, Michael Walsh needed more. In court, Walsh would later state that the ever-generous Seb had given this stranger his wallet, his money, and his credit cards. And in his intoxicated and comatose state, Seb had asked Walsh, his newfound friend, to nip to the bank, withdraw some cash, and score them both some drugs. Of course, whether this is true, only two people actually know. And one of those would soon be dead. Paranoid at the risk of his theft being discovered, Walsh roped in 22-year-old Daniel Hasty, an autistic friend and a rough sleeper, who on many occasions had slept in Euston Station and knew of Seb's warmth, kindness and generosity amongst London's homeless. But being hungry, cold and easily led by an older man, Daniel Hasty was lured in with the promise of money, food, warmth and a new tracksuit and trainers. Over the next 18 hours, having forged his signature, Walsh and Hasty withdrew £1,690, almost the entire contents of Seb's account, as he slept solidly and soundly. Giddy with their good fortune, and weighed down with their new purchases of food, drink, drugs and fancy footwear. A little after lunchtime on Wednesday the 23rd of September 2015, Walsh and Hasty returned to the Wharfdale Road flat to slip Seb's much lighter wallet back into his pocket, as if nothing had happened. 
But sometime during the night, something had happened. Seb was still lying on the sofa. He was still, he was silent, and he was cold. His tanned olive complexion was ominously pale. His lips had a bluish hue, as around his gaping mouth, on the sofa and the floor, puddles of congealed vomit had pooled. His once twinkling brown eyes were wide open, the pupils fixed like tiny pinpoints of darkness. And his lifeless body was contorted into an agonising shape of convulsions, a stroke, seizures and heart failure had taken his life. As 46-year-old Sebastiano Magnanini lay there, dead, on the sofa of a well-known drug dealer, with a long history of theft to fund his all-consuming habit, Walsh began to panic. Seb was dead, and Walsh had no idea what to do. Not having a garden or a spade, he couldn't bury him. Not having a car, he couldn't drive him to a morgue. And not wanting the police involved, he couldn't call for an ambulance. So taking another quick hit of crack to calm his nerves, which quickly caused his paranoia to spiral, Walsh roped in 64-year-old Paul Williams, another homeless friend with a promise of money, food and Class A drugs. They needed to dump the body, somewhere near, somewhere quick and somewhere accessible. In a sprawling metropolis like London, they had just one option, the canal. Stealing a shopping trolley from the local branch of Tesco Metro, Walsh and Williams loaded the 15 stone corpse into the silver wired frame, secured his wrists, ankles and neck with duct tape, squeezed his contorted body into the fetal position, his arms, legs and head tucked tightly into his chest, and having weighed down the trolley with dumbbells to ensure that it would sink, they covered the corpse with a simple bedsheet and waited for the right moment to leave. At roughly 4.45am on Thursday the 24th of September 2015, Walsh and Williams exited the flat on Wharfdale Road, turned left and pushed the overloaded trolley towards Caledonian Road, a brightly lit city street which, even at this ungodly hour, is regularly patrolled by the police and is screened by CCTV. But then again, in an area such as King's Cross, which is synonymous with drugs, theft and poverty, what's so suspicious about two homeless looking men pushing a shopping trolley full of bedding? Nothing. Nothing at all. And yet, the disposal of the corpse of Sebastiano Magnanini wouldn't be as simple as a quick trip to the canal. As with the overloaded trolley having a wonky wheel, the streets full of inclines, the paths full of broken paving stones, very few curbs having ramps, and with the nearest stretch of canal often filled with long lines of narrowboats, full of sleeping but easily awoken occupants. Walsh and Williams needed a place which was dark, shadowy and secluded. And so they had to wheel this trolley of death left up Caledonian Road and right along to the Islington Tunnel. A full half mile along brightly lit roads full of residential houses. A perilous journey which took almost 20 minutes. At 5.15am, being unseen, 
and having unsteadily wheeled this wonky trolley down a sharply declining slope towards the unlit towpath of the Regent's Canal. Walsh and Williams stopped at the entrance of the west portal of the Islington Tunnel. A dead end shrouded in trees and shadows, and a dark gaping hole out of sight of prying eyes. And with no prayers, no grace, and no care given, the body of Sebastiano Magnanini was dumped into a watery grave. Cast into the canal, like a stolen bike, as Walsh and Williams fled, his friends unaware of his death, his family unaware that he was missing, and his few remaining savings used to feed the drug habit of a desperate junkie. A sad burial for a good man who had lost a long battle with his evil demons. At 8am, a few hours later, eager to chug from Islington to Little Venice on a three-hour trip consisting of three and a half miles, four locks and probably six cups of tea, well, I am British, I set off into the cold, dank and dark gloom of the east portal of the Islington Tunnel, a tight one-mile tube of stone illuminated by a single headlight and a tiny pinpoint of daylight way in the distance. After 30 minutes of shadows, solitude and a steady drip from above, as I approached the entrance to the west portal of the Islington Tunnel, something scraped along the underside of my boat. Slowly creeping near the rear where I was stood, and looking down into the inky water to spy the origin of this rough metallic scraping underneath. As my eyes adjusted to the light, I sneezed. Achoo! Both eyes shut, blinded by the morning sun, distracted by an urgent need for tissues, and with the canal being a thick murky soup of mud and silt after two days of rain, and speckled with a light drizzle, the scraping had stopped, I saw nothing, and carried on. Unaware, unfazed, and oblivious. I guess I was lucky. As seeing something that horrific, that shocking, in such a tranquil setting, could scar a person for life. But barely half an hour later, with the drizzle having stopped, and the low sun hitting the water at an acutely sharp angle. Whilst taking his morning walk along the towpath, an Australian tourist and his seven-year-old daughter saw in the water the metallic glint of a shopping trolley and a bedsheet which had slipped. Having roped off the scene, questioned the residents, and erected a bright yellow tent for forensics. Detectives from New Scotland Yard fished out of the canal the bloated and decaying body of an unknown man, with no name, no ID, and no wallet. But with his body being as colourful as his life, police issued a description of his distinctive tattoos, a carp on his shoulder, and a few small tattoos on his fingers. Later that day, Sebastiano Magnanini was claimed by his distraught family. Naturally, the press, smelling the stench of a salacious story of a mysterious man who'd been hogtied to a trolley and dumped in the canal, was too good to miss. But the second that Chief Inspector Rebecca Reeves stated, His past in Italy has been taken into consideration since we are at the initial stages of the investigation. The press started to froth at the mouth, their feverish brains going into theory overdrive, and entirely ignored Chief Inspector Reeves's caveat that, but at present we do not believe that the crime can be traced back to organised crime. No, there was dirt to be dug, 
and the press started digging. What they found was this. On the 14th of December 1993, 23-year-old Seb, along with two cash-strapped chums, stole an 18th century painting. The Education of the Virgin by the Rococo master Giovanni Battista Tiepolo from the Church of Santa Maria della Fava in his hometown of Venice. Having badly bungled the job by bringing the wrong tools, the hapless trio met back a few beers, toked on a few joints and then returned to the church. Eventually stealing the two billion lira painting, which is worth about one million pounds, but unsure who to sell it to, or how to hide this three metre by two metre canvas. They stashed the famous painting in a farmhouse, and they were later arrested, with Seb serving 18 months for theft. Obviously, being Italian, even those British bastions of supposedly quality journalism, like The Guardian, The Independent, and even The Telegraph, drooled over these delicious details and emblazoned every article with the revelation that this may be either a revenge killing, an underworld connection, or possibly a mafia hit. But the autopsy would prove otherwise. Sebastiano Magnanini had died of the acute toxic effects of heroin, cocaine, cannabis and alcohol in his system. In January 2016, after CCTV showed Walsh and Williams pushing the weighty trolley along Caledonian Road, and Walsh and Hasty withdrawing money from the bank, Walsh, Williams and Hasty were arrested and pleaded guilty. But not to murder, or even manslaughter. 41-year-old Michael Walsh and 64-year-old Paul Williams were charged with the lesser offence of preventing the unlawful burial of a body and were sentenced to serve four years and two years apiece, with 22-year-old Daniel Hasty serving just 12 months for conspiracy to commit fraud by false representation. And having concluded that the death of Sebastiano Magnanini was an accidental overdose, with most of the evidence having washed away, the DNA traces unusable, and his body badly decomposed, many details of this case are a mystery. And yet, one detail in particular remains unresolved. If Seb's death was an accident, why was he found with a broken nose and a blunt force trauma to the head? Did he fall over whilst intoxicated? Was he dropped while his body was being disposed of? Or was this sweet-natured man with 1,900 pounds in the bank violently assaulted by a desperate drug addict with an addiction to feed. That we shall never know. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. If you're looking for a new true crime podcast, then this week's treat is the absolutely brilliant and also one of my personal favourites, the Texas-based true crime podcast called All Crime, No Cattle. Hosted by Shay and Erin, All Crime, No Cattle deep dives into the murky world of the Lone Star State's darkest killers. With each episode packed to the brim with juicy details, solid research and is neatly balanced by an honest compassion for the victims, a heartfelt sympathy for their situation and a fantastic chemistry between both hosts. It really is a treat. So please do check out All Crime, No Cattle. Do you like true crime? Do you like Texas? Then you should check out our podcast, All Crime, No Cattle. 
which focuses on true crime stories from the Lone Star State. I'm Shay. And I'm Erin. We're a conversational podcast, meaning we like to joke around, but we also strive to bring you a balanced and well-researched story. We do the research so you don't have to. We end every episode with a good news story, just to remind everyone that real life isn't quite as depressing as true crime can make it out to be. New episodes drop every Wednesday, and you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. All crime, no cattle, because crime is bigger in Texas, y'all. And don't forget to check out the Murder Mile website at murdermiletours.com. Find us on Twitter or Instagram, or even better, join the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast discussion group on Facebook. Just while we're here, a quick thank you goes out this week to some fabulous people who have left reviews of the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast and have been truly fabulous on social media. They include Erin Nichols, Elizabeth Dowdle, Erin Fleming, Beth McKenzie, Jennifer Seavers, Dale Pennycook, Hannah Merzer, Stephanie Kunz, Nisha Kennedy Robinson, Kelly Palmer, Vanessa Chapa Humfield, Esther Amrandarix Ludlow, Sean Maloney, Paula Cole, Ronnie Ball, Charlie Worrell, Robin Warder, Jennifer O'Dell, Catherine Spencer Cook, Scuns18, Laurie K1, and Zimbelina13. <sighs> if I've missed you, I apologise. Feel free to buzz me and say, Oi! And if you've reviewed the Murder Mile True Crime podcast recently, don't forget that these podcasts are actually recorded about two weeks before they're released. So your thank you may take a while to filter through. But to everyone who listens, I thank you. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with No Name. Next week's episode is part two of our Canal Killing series. This time it features the mysterious death, disappearance and disposal of Marta Ligman. Thank you for listening and sleep well. Hello? Hello? Oh, hello. Welcome to oh, the Extra Mile. I know, most people have probably switched off by this point. In fact, most people probably switch off when we get to the uh, the outro that we've just done. But for you lovely, fantastic people, what I'm going to start doing is doing a little bit extra at the end of the show. This is where I give you kind of information uh, about the show, what we've just listened to, and some little nuggets that I might not be able to tell you. So, here goes. This episode, Sebastiano Magnanini. Um, Now, I couldn't do my usual research on this case, because obviously with this case only happening in 2015, there is no file at the National Archives. Uh, It's probably not going to be released for at least 50 or 70 years. Could be 100 years, who knows. Um, So... Most of this is based on press articles, but I had to do my own particular branch of research. I don't like trusting other people's research. I love diving in and doing my own stuff. So, in order to get the details right, I had to speak to a lot of locals. Um, Slightly difficult doing that, going into areas uh, around King's Cross, talking about known drug dealers. Not always a clever thing to do, but, you know, if you sit in a pub long enough, you get chatting people come out with information especially pub landlords very useful Um, but the big piece of research I did on this was if you read any story about this case the press always say that um, if you read it they say they put the body of, of Seb into the trolley and then they wheeled the trolley to the canal every article says the same they put it in the same sentence put him in a trolley wheeled him to the canal my brain doesn't work that way my brain goes okay how long did that take how difficult was it and I really wanted to know this and this is not something that you could read in a book so what I did (laughs) was I replicated the journey Uh, obviously I don't have a corpse Uh, obviously it's not legal for me to go walk in the streets with a corpse Um, so what I did was I got a shopping trolley 
I went to Wharfdale Road, uh, roughly in the middle. We don't know where this flat is, so I, I took it as the middle of the road-ish. Um, we know that Seb weighed 15 stone, um, and I, so which is 95 kilos, and I worked out that each brick, if a household brick, is about 3 kilos. So if I put into the trolley 31 bricks, that is the equivalent of 15 stone, or Seb's weight. Uh, that filled about two layers of the bottom of the, the trolley. So I put that in, really heavy. Luckily, there was, a, there was a, a guy clearing out a basement nearby, so we had loads of bricks. Very useful, otherwise it would have been stuck. And I wheeled the trolley down that route. So down Wharfdale Road, left onto um, a Caledonian Road, and then down onto the towpath. Just to see how difficult it was. It should be an eight minute walk because it's just over half a mile. Eight, nine minutes. It actually took me nearer 19 minutes. Uh, it was a real pig. Um, most pavements aren't straight. They tend to camber. They tend to lean into the road. Uh, I think that's a drainage thing. Uh, most of them pockmarked. Uh, there's uh, paving slabs all broken. Uh, there was no kind of ramps. I had to really fo force hard. And also the weight of the trolley was forcing the trolley out off centre. So it was a real pig. So yeah, um, it was hard work. I understand entirely why two people had to do it. Uh, Walsh and Williams. Um, pushing the trolley, the weighted trolley, down that final incline towards the canal was a nightmare because the weight of 15 stone in the trolley literally was dragging my feet i could i could hear my trainers scraping uh, as i was trying to stop the trolley from running away so it, it made sense that there were two two men pushing this trolley uh but yeah that's the research i did to try and get the details right i also walked various routes to see which was the best route for them to get from the house to to the canal there was three different routes i could have could have gone um i went the route that i thought was the fastest and the safest because they never actually stated exactly which route they went. But this was the one that was the most dark, and the one that they, I, I felt that they would not get caught. Uh, another piece of research I did um, was into the effects of uh, different drugs. Now, obviously, I'm not really a drug person. I, I, do you know what? I don't even smoke anymore. Uh, I don't drink that much. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't really smoked weed in a long time. Uh, I don't really like drugs. So, uh, But I needed to know about the effects of drugs, and you can't really get that from a book. So, courtesy of my job as a tour guide in Soho, um, the good thing about this job is that you get to know a lot of homeless people. Um, the more I do this job, the more I realise that actually homeless people, really, really vast majority, really decent people... Um, although they ask for money, it's not really money they want. What they want is someone to talk to because they get ignored all the time. So um, I find homeless people a really good, valuable source of information. And especially in this case, because many of them have uh, addictions, I was able to ask them honestly uh, in return for a cup of tea and a couple of pairs of clean socks. It's really what homeless people want is a cup of tea and clean socks. That's the basics to get them through the day. Uh, and a bit of money for some shelter as well. Uh, I asked many of them about any addictions that they had, such as crack, heroin, alcohol, uh, skunk cannabis, um, and their information was really useful. So so that inf that description of uh, how Seb was in a cocoon of marshmallow, that was directly take it, taken from one of the people I met. That's exactly how he described it, and uh, how it makes you feel, and you know how how it it's a warm, tingly feeling. So um, that was really useful. Um, that's another way that I do research, um, first hand information. Obviously, I can't speak to uh, Sebastian Magnanini because uh, he's dead, but I can speak to people who are drug addicts who can give me advice. Um, Final little interesting piece of information. So if you listen to The Extra Mile, episode one, which came out two weeks ago, um, I was talking in that about how the theme tune to Murder Mile is a fantastic song. Do you know, it goes... Doo, doo, doo. It starts with that. Um, that's a fantastic song called Man in a Bag by the fantastic cult with no name. Um, I didn't really know what the song was about. Um, the guys, um, Johnny and Eric, they don't really say what it's about to be honest um it, they tend to keep it quite secret and i mentioned that in that episode what eric let me know man in a bag 
the theme song to Murder Mile is about a gentleman called Gareth Williams. Um, he was a GCHQ employee. So GCHQ is like the intelligence centre for Britain. Uh, it's where all of the information comes into and they disseminate everything and they find terrorists. And it's all very exciting. Um, a couple of years ago, Gareth uh, was found inside a zipped up bag inside his own bath. And m they were unable to decide whether it was a suicide attempt whether it was a sex game that had gone wrong, whether it was a murder or whether it was a contract hit. Uh, it's a really baffling story. So that's what Man in a Bag is about. If you're interested in uh, hearing more about that, uh, another fantastic UK true crime podcast called Red Handed. Really amazing. They do, re they do really interesting kind of um, curious cases. They don't go for serial killers, things like that. They go for baffling cases that just make you go, Oh, wow. OK. Uh, Red Handed, they actually did an episode called Man in a Bag. Weirdly. So check that out if you want to know more about Gareth Williams, who was the inspiration for the Murder Mile theme tune, Man in a Bag. I hope that was interesting. That was Murder Mile Extra, the extra mile. Uh, I might do one of these every so often at the end of the podcast, just for you lovely people who stay right to the end. In the meantime, have a good day and stay safe. Bye-bye.